We live in an age where it's acceptable to close a venue rich in sporting history, leaving it descending into disrepair. This was a place where the world's best riders came to do battle. League titles were won, British championships were contested in front of bumper crowds, a place that held Grand Prix. British riders lifted trophies on the world stage and a stepping stone to crowning a British world champion. This city was declared the European City of Sport just months after allowing a motorsports venue with a speedway history dating back to 1928 to close its doors and lay dormant. This is a time when it's okay for a sporting body put together by the government to protect sports facilities and their rich heritage actively recommend to councils the destruction of multi-purpose motorsports venue for the development of houses and a gym. Places of significant importance to the history of motorsport in the UK have nothing to show where it started. People can pass through the very birthplace of our sport without ever knowing it existed. The green age is upon us. Motorsports are on the front lines facing daily battles to survive. Some flourishing, others in retreat. The digital era is shown in the door and it must adapt to survive. Could a sport once featured on premium channels on a Saturday night descend into a semi-professional pastime? Could the sport cease to exist as we know it? Has any other sport succumbed to its wounds and died off entirely? Speedway's loyal following is ageing. People within the sport whose passion knows no limits acknowledge that change needs to come. Every winter we wait, hoping for the magic wand, the answers to all our problems. Every spring we stand and watch, knowing it's not enough. People often describe Speedway like a terminal cancer patient, battling hard to survive but knowing the end is inevitable. Negative thought breeds adverse action. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe we could describe Speedway's plight differently. It's the green grass on the lawn. Once well cut and a beautiful green, the weeds started to grow and take hold. The grass making way for moss with yellows and browns dominating the landscape. But with love and care, the weeds can be treated the debris removed, new seeds sown in the rich soil full of minerals. The lawn will look brown for a while, maybe more mud than grass, but patience in our plan to rebuild. Patience that one day the grass can be green and flourish again. In 1964, the sport had just seven teams in the top flight and 12 in the second division. It came back from that with strength and resilience. It can do it again. Due to time constraints, we've split this video into two parts. This is part one and we'll be talking about the most prevalent issues in Speedway. We've had to simplify the sections otherwise this video would have been about four hours long. Maybe we'll do more videos on each section in the future but who knows. You might feel always lost by the end of part one but fear not. In part two we'll be looking at potential solutions for the issues raised, how we can overcome the extreme downward pressure on Speedway and turn its fortunes around. We'll be releasing part two in chapters, so watch out for them on our channel. We hope you enjoy the video. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport. The thrill of victory. 
There was a time when life was far narrower. TV had just three channels, sport was on Saturday, and you had the likes of Grandstand, Match of the Day, and World of Sport. You got your news from TV, from the newspapers, word of mouth, or even teletext. Speedway was covered in the papers and had a regular spot on World of Sport. Television started to really develop with 24-hour broadcasting and additional channels. Speedway occupied the subconscious of millions and was able to reach beyond the borders of its own fan base. In 2021, Speedway lurks in the shadows. It's there, but you need to really know it's there when you look, otherwise you could quite easily miss it. I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. Speedway doesn't occupy the mind space of the general public. People aren't talking about it, newspapers don't cover it, sports news channels no longer broadcast results or even league tables. In 2018, the World Championship was secured for the third time by a British rider, the first time in our history, but the headlines eluded the new three-time world champion. The truth is, most people in the UK don't even know Speedway exists or existed. And if they did, it's a distant memory of the 1970s and 1980s when Speedway occupied a prime time slot in people's minds and would feature on newspapers. The main British broadcaster paid for by public funding doesn't even consider Speedway noteworthy as a sport. National exposure comes at a premium for any non-mainstream sport. There is the odd occasion we get positive exposure, but when it comes to league racing, it's the negative stuff that makes the news. There's no longer a major or a panel embracing the opportunities available in the British market. Nobody embracing the evolving demands of the economy and adjusting the sport to suit. Our marketplace is small. Speedway is a niche within a motorsports niche. Even motorcyclists don't come to watch it in large numbers. Crowds are dropping and we don't appear to know what to do about it. In November 2018, Speedway Star published an entire issue revolving around the future of the sport, sending a clear message, changes were needed to restore the sport to former glories and perhaps beyond. Every winter the AGM passes by, but nothing substantial appears to change. You often hear people say Speedway needs to become a non-professional sport in the UK. It's absurd when you think about it, but at first glance you can understand why people think this. The professional image just isn't there. Pre-match parades, half the time track staff are wandering onto the centre green like stragglers at a concert. Presentation is overlooked across the board. The demands of different demographics aren't quite being met at each Speedway experience. We have mascots at some tracks, but not at others. We have charismatic centre green announcers at some tracks, but not at others. You can have two vastly different experiences of Speedway depending on where you go, and not just because of the facilities available. When you enter Sun Stadiums, it's like you've gone through a time warp. They're playing music from the 1980s on tinny little speakers, and the decor is suited to the music's era. Speedway is now competing with vast home comforts like television, streaming services, video games and the internet. Tempting people out is much harder than it once was. We have lots of new challenges to address, things like persistent night closures on the roads and people seeking more value for their money. Is it possible for youth of today to get as excited about a Speedway race in the way we did in our youth, especially when you consider the technology available today? This issue is further compounded by the Speedway's lack of presence in the digital market. Streaming services have been introduced in some places, but overall it's very unfocused. The official website and the social channels have started putting out race clips, which is certainly a start, but it doesn't quite air that professional image enough. We could really do with three to four minute highlight clips from each match. A few races with narration over the top, followed by one interview from each side. The official channels are improving their digital footprint. Regular match previews and weekly roundups can be found on the official website and regular social media posts with pictures from the matches, but more work is needed. You'll often hear the complaint that Speedway doesn't get news exposure, but the sport itself 
needs to do more to encourage the professional image that it needs. Speedway is rarely thought of as part of our local communities. It's the noisy neighbour that needs to be muted. It's largely about perception. Look at Formula One. As a sport, it's no better than Speedway, but as a product, it's a commercial giant. The Formula One business and industrial strength means the sport can't be bullied the way Speedway is. I'm sure people at Sports England would think twice before delivering a damning report on a road racing circuit if it had an effect on Formula One. The same applies to football. Can you imagine the residents of Birmingham complaining about the noise at St Andrews? Football is part of the local community. You've got youth academies bringing in kids on the weekends and weeknights, social clubs, public initiatives and support from the local community. Football clubs are viewed as an integral part of the city. Speedway is the pesky little sport which insists on continuing despite the low attendances and rundown facilities. This leads me to the stadiums themselves. Speedway repeatedly falls foul of excessive red tape, constant issues with planning, developers pressure, licensing, local complaints from residents, curfews, parking restrictions, noise limitations and bureaucracy from town halls. On top of all this, very few tracks are owned by the Speedway clubs, so they have to operate within the confines of greyhounds, stock cars, football, rugby or temperamental managing agents and landlords. Motorsport is generally seen as less popular, especially in modern trendy areas like London where people think on a greener line and feel motorsport is detrimental to the environment. Track issues are often compared to Poland, but people forget Polish councils not only back the clubs, they actively fund the speedway teams, contributing as much as 30% of their annual budgets. Tracks are closing faster than they are opening. Prime locations are being lost to small venues in obscure locations. We now have large chunks of the country where there are no tracks anywhere. The history of the sport is in jeopardy and we need to protect it at all costs. You've got Bradford that first opened in 1946, Cradley Heath 1947, Reading 1968, Newport 1964, Exeter 1947, all gone, and Coventry that first opened in 1928, sitting there laying dormant. These are just a few examples of the generations of fans that we're losing, years of history lost each time. If we are to survive, we need to become stronger, more resilient, no longer be a constant retreat, we need to fight back, take the front foot, let people know Speedway is a major player and you will take us seriously. Closure is not an option. All the resources we have need to be thrown behind keeping places like Coventry alive, not just to run, but to become the hub of Speedway in the future. I bet you've all been there, talking to someone, and you tell them you're off to Speedway tomorrow, and they'll say, is that that thing where the cars go around in circles? <laughs> Cue your internal organs exploding, and you jumping across the table in an attempt to strangle said innocent bystander for their ignorance. Lisa, no! Your hands are too weak! <laughs> this is the reality of modern Speedway. I've lost count of the amount of times someone said to me, I didn't know that was still going, or... I used to go to Speedway at, insert random track name here, back in, insert year. They'll probably vaguely recall Ivan Major or Barry Briggs and one of the heat leaders at their former local team. This is especially prevalent in London, where there isn't a single track left. A place where the pinnacle of the sport was once staged, now a distant memory. The core fan base started to slip away. Once it's gone, getting it back is hugely challenging. Speedway needs to appeal to fresh blood, but it doesn't appear to know who the new demographic is. We often say Speedway is a family sport, yet it runs on weeknights in school term time starting at 7.30 and often finishing at 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night. Any families with kids under 11 are likely to be put off as kids' bedtimes for school the next day are generally much earlier than this. The sport has a strong integral fan base, but it's not growing. Referral marketing is the strongest type available. I follow the sport because of my dad, and I'm sure many of you do because of friends and family. 
If we are to attract new fans, we need to change the way people look at the sport from the outside. Speedway's mindset is inherently negative within, and this is hugely influenced by the fans and public perception. Rightly or wrongly, hardcore fans don't trust the powers within Speedway to carry it forwards. Transparency has been lacking when it comes to decision making within British Speedway. It is true that people often feel they have the right to more information than is practical, but that expectation still needs to be managed. If the very few people who follow the sport can't recommend it, what chance does it have to survive among the wider demographics? This is the message that needs to change. In 1992, when football embraced television and became the Premier League, one thing never changed, the game of football. Yes, 20 years later it's starting to change with the introduction of VAR, but the core game remains intact. If a match is one-sided, it stays one-sided. If it was Speedway, you can just imagine the introduction of a rule where the club can go three goals down and nominate a player to score double, or something along those lines. Speedway as a sport is easy to understand in principle but the rules surrounding it are constantly changing. Averages would freeze riders out of the sport, riders could get double points one season and not the next. The amount of points you get just for winning a match has changed frequently. The sport isn't always easy to follow and make sense to a general audience. If it's difficult to explain a rule to someone, chances are it's overcomplicated. A confused mind doesn't buy. I'm very aware why they make these changes, it's usually to keep the score close and the match interesting, but all the tinkering is irrelevant to a new audience if they don't have a scorecard. Here's an example to show what I mean. If you walked into a football match 30 minutes in and watched the rest of it not knowing the score, the impact of what's happening on the pitch will be lessened by you not knowing the consequences for crunch moments in the game. You can imagine an injury time equaliser for the home team, all the fans jumping around going mad and you're standing there because you didn't realise the score. You didn't understand the consequence of what happened on the pitch. If we want people to get invested in the action on track, we need to ensure that they have context for what's happening. The scorecard is the most crucial part of the match day experience and presently the only way to obtain one is buying a programme. We need to give people a reason to get invested in what they're watching. Let's get one thing clear, Speedway is extremely dangerous. In the 40s and 50s there was a death nearly every year on track. Norwich's first stadium saw four riders killed in four years from track related incidents. In the modern age, Speedway has become far safer, mainly due to the invention of air fences, but it would be prudent for us not to get complacent. The bikes are much faster and rider safety must be priority one at every Speedway match. Medical cover forms a big part of that safety criteria. Crashes at Speedway are an inevitability. All it takes is a rider to clip a wheel at the wrong moment and carnage ensues, even on the safest and most well prepared tracks. Every now and again we see a crash that reminds us just how much the riders put on the line every time they go out on the track. When these crashes do happen, the question is, what happens then? Thankfully, most of the time the ambulance comes onto the track, the riders can walk back, but occasionally it's a bit more serious and the ambulance needs to take the fallen rider to hospital. Incidents are rarely severe enough to abandon the meeting, so how do we keep the crowd engaged when these delays do occur? Even better, how do we reduce the delay time without compromising on priority one, rider safety? Delays due to injuries aren't exclusive to Speedway. It happens in British Superbikes, it happens in MotoGP and it happens in motocross. I went to 20 matches this season, and out of those, I encountered lengthy delays at Kent after Dan Gilks and Jack Smith collided, Kings Lynn when Rory Schlein was injured, delays at Paul because of a hole on Ben 3, and a crash which was caused by said hole, delays at Birmingham when Stefan Nilsson hit the deck, Isle of Wight when Ruth Holder Smith was injured in a nasty tumble on the straight. We know this happens, but to this day, we haven't taken meaningful steps to address the issue.
This is England, and in England, it rains. It rains a lot. Oh my god! Speedway isn't the only sport that's vulnerable to the elements. Lower league football often suffers rain offs and frozen pitches in the winter months. In 2018, the British Moto Grand Prix was rained out, but the best comparable to Speedway is cricket, as the sport is vulnerable to wet weather. Sadly, like medical cover, this has been a glaring ever-present issue with no consistent solution across the leagues. In 2021, two playoff matches scheduled for TV got postponed due to rain and the consequence, both legs of Bellevue and Sheffield's playoffs didn't get screened on TV. The entire season, building up to the playoffs which are designed with TV in mind, and one semi-final wasn't even aired. People often complain about Speedway's playoffs running in October as they are prime targets for poor weather. Analysis of UK rainfall data backs up this stance as October is by far the wettest month of the year in the UK. The other problem is the huge toll rain-offs take on the fans, especially travelling supporters. I'm sure every supporter listening to this can relate. I made the trip to Leicester this year for their match against Edinburgh in May only to watch the heavens open up and the track become suitable for jet skiing within about 10 minutes. 240 mile round trip to watch riders walk around the track. But that is tame in comparison to some when you consider the Edinburgh fans also made the journey. People want an element of certainty when they do things. Providers of modern entertainment must find what brings punters to them. They have to identify what is considered good value by the masses and deliver that. But if they're going to choose Speedway, it has to come with some certainties. Certainties it presently can't deliver. This is possibly the issue fans are most vocal about, and it is understandable. I didn't have an issue with doubling up when it was first brought in, but as time's gone on, it's no longer doubling up. It's doubling down, doubling sideways, even tripling up. I'm seeing double here. Four crusties! The original concept was to give riders more time on the bike to earn a living and fast track their experience path. In the end, we had riders representing two professional clubs and a national league side simultaneously. Speedway has always been a different sport to most. Riders can ride in other leagues across Europe whilst competing in the British League. People generally don't have an issue with riders doubling up with foreign clubs, but riding for two British clubs is observed differently. Doubling isn't inherently a new issue, as it was present with top flight reserves in the 1970s, but we didn't have stiff European competition to consider at the time. Doubling up doesn't have much relevance when it comes to marketing the sport to new people, but it's difficult to attract new fans when the riders represent two professional teams within Britain. The reality is, doubling up devalues the top flight. The entire Premiership winning team in 2021 represent other sides in the Championship. You've got Bjorn Pedersen at Plymouth, Hans Anderson at Leicester, Chris Harris at Birmingham, Scott Nichols at Kent, Ulrich Ostergaard at Glasgow, Jordan Paling, Scunthorpe and finally Michael Palmtoft who was at Redcar. It removes all perceived value from the second division and it removes actual value from the Premiership. The skill gap between Premiership and Championship is no longer present. Added to this, the skill gap between National League and Championship is too high. National Development League heat leaders are struggling in the Championship but they are dominant in the Development League because the bar for entry is lower than it has been in the last decade. I don't for a minute blame the riders. At the end of the day, they are making a living from Speedway. Most of the riders who double up are still very capable riders but either don't have the resources or are not at the calibre required for an international league. Doubling with European clubs is seen as an acceptable practice at this point and is the best way for riders to earn the big money they deserve. Be that as it may, if Speedway within Britain is to be taken seriously, the issue of doubling between professional league clubs must be resolved. This is a weird one and I often feel conflicted about it. On the one hand, I understand the concept as it keeps matches competitive when top riders are missing, whilst giving the guests a chance to earn a few extra quid and saves promoters money on the squad system. I think one reason I don't pay much attention to guests is that I've grown up with it being the norm. To me, it doesn't stick out as a major issue. The truth is, guests massively undermine the competitive image of speedway teams. 
It makes a mockery of fan loyalty towards their riders and it makes Speedway very hard for people outside its circles to take seriously. In 2017, I took a friend to the Knockout Cup final at Peterborough who faced Ipswich. Jack Holder was injured so we watched Scott Nichols guest and score 12 paid 13 for Peterborough against the Witches in the first leg. The Panthers won by 4 points so we decided to make the trip to Ipswich for the second leg. In the second leg we watched Scott Nichols score 13 for Ipswich against the Panthers in the same final riding for the other team. It completely devalued the final. The Witches drew the home leg so Peterborough won the knockout cup. Scott Nichols ended up on the losing side even though he was on the other side four days earlier. If the British League is to be taken seriously amongst general sport aficionados, guest riders will need looking at and eventually phasing out. Tracks have changed over the years, but then so have the bikes. Four valve laydown engines have led to more power distribution to the back wheel. Lightened flywheels have made the bikes more unpredictable. Tracks gradually have become slicker to cope with the more powerful machinery. I've watched plenty of older matches on video and online to see tracks have always been inconsistent in Speedway. There's been plenty of times the golden greats of Major, Briggs, Fundin, Gunderson and Nielsen rode on total bogs under the guise of Speedway tracks. There's often a perception that longer, wider, high speed tracks create more entertaining racing. You can see where this opinion comes from as most internationals and GP events are on these style tracks. I'd be interested to see how the likes of Schmarschlick, Laguta and Saifudinov would navigate Eastbourne, Plymouth or Edinburgh. One thing I do know is that Jason Crump, Tony Ricardson, Lee Adams and Nicky Pedersen could ride the small tracks just as aggressively and dominantly as the sweeping European circuits. The small track can produce stunning racing without question. It is true that bigger tracks tend to produce more consistent overtaking opportunities. Larger tracks alone won't bring fans back. Tracks in Sweden are like Poland, but they're also facing challenges with dropping attendances. Nobody wants to see washing line speedway, but it is true that tracks in this country are too often producing substandard surfaces for the riders. Too often we see reports of delays in matches in perfectly good weather conditions due to the state of the track. Too often we see crashes caused by issues which can be easily circumvented with the right knowledge and experience amongst the track staff. The 2021 Premiership Playoffs showed us that if you produce a good racing surface, the riders will perform. Let's make matches like this the norm and not the exception. This is often a central debate around the success of Speedway. Is it too expensive? Have the admission prices spiralled out of control? Will people choose Speedway over other offerings? We've done a detailed analysis of the figures which can be found on our website, but here's the basic overview. Inflation is on average 2.8% per year. Using the Bank of England's model for inflation, we've calculated that £1 from the year 2000 is worth £1.72 in 2021. This means £10 from the year 2000 has an equal value of £17.21 in today's market. The average cost of Speedway match in 2000 was £10. In 2021 it's £18.50. After inflation is considered you're paying around 16% more for Division 1 of Premiership Speedway compared to the year 2000. Division 2 or the Championship has risen by 4%. The cost of your matchday programme is better value though, it's risen from an average of £1.80 to £3. Even if your programme cost £2 in 2000, you would expect to pay around £3.44 in 2021 based on the inflation. Now, this is all well and good, but it doesn't account for how much people make in 2021 compared to 2000. The median annual earnings for a full-time employed in 2000 was 18848 In 2021, is 31,461. People's income on average has gone up by 67% across the UK since 2000. I'm looking at median and not average salary because the figure isn't affected by adversely high or low salaries. People earn 67% more than they used to in 2000. The price of Speedway has gone up by around 85% on average. People are paying about 18% more to watch Speedway than they did in the year 2000 when you consider their earnings. 
This is of course hugely oversimplifying the data as it doesn't account for many variables such as the financial crash in 2008, housing markets, accelerating growth rate, demographical factors like age, gender, location, occupation etc. But it still paints an interesting picture. It's like a snapshot of what's happening. How does Speedway compare to other forms of entertainment? Now, I've compared a few different entertainment types to Speedway to see how the cost compares. For the sake of consistency, I've taken prices from three different areas of the country. Paul, Glasgow and Peterborough. In Paul, you'll be paying £9.99 for your adult cinema ticket at Cineworld, £7.99 for students and seniors go for £5.99 as do children. Hollywood Bowl at Tower Park charges £15.80 for two adult games and £12.90 for juniors. The Coastal Comedy Club in Paul ranges from £15 to £19 if you pay in advance and £20 to £25 on the door. Paul Town FC, who play in the Southern League Premier Division South or the 7th tier in football, charge £12 for adults £8 for concessions, £5 for under 18s and £1 for under 13s. You could drive to Weymouth for a National League football who charge £16 to £18 for adults, £11 to £13 for concessions. Under 19s is £7, children under 16 go for £4, under 7s for £1. Paul Speedway is £17 for adults, concessions are £14, students go for £10, under 16s is £6 and under 11s they go for free. Now, let's look at Glasgow. Tinnywell Glasgow has the same price structure as Paul. Springfield Quay Bowling Alley, you'll pay £14.40 for two games and £11.90 for the kids. The prices at Coatbridge are about the same. The Stand Comedy Club ranges from £10 to £15. Glasgow's old firm Derby averages at about £52 per ticket. You can drive down the road though to Motherwell, but no Scottish Premiership game will cost you less than £20 per ticket. You can get £5 tickets for kids with a full paying adult if you go over to Ross County. Glasgow Tigers, you'll be paying £17 for adults, £10 for students and children under 17. Under 12s, they go for free. Glasgow do offer a family ticket at £44, but I couldn't find any further details on what was included in this at the time of recording. Now let's look at Peterborough. Showcase Cinema in Peterborough is £11.80 for adults, students and seniors get in for £9.30 and children are £7.75. Hollywood Bowl charges £14.80 for two adult games and £11.90 for juniors. The Chrisette Comedy Club will set you back £14.50 per person. If you fancy watching Peterborough United or The Posh in the Championship, you'll be paying around £22 to £28 per adult. Seniors are £17 to £23. Under 22s are £13 to £17. Under 18, £9 to £11. And under 12s, they go for free. Peterborough Speedway charges £20 for adults. Concessions are £18. Children under 16 are a fiver and under 5 years old they go for free. According to Peterborough's website, children under 16 are actually £8, but every time I've been there I've paid £5 for my daughter, so that's the figure I'll be using for the comparison. One of the key issues which depicts the picture of spiralling admission costs is other entertainment mediums haven't increased in line with inflation. The cinema, for example, has risen by 53% since 2000. Tenpin bowling by 55%. Comedy shows is around 61%. All below the inflation rate of 67%. The exception, of course, is top flight football, which has increased by a staggering 137% since 2000. One last thing worth looking at is the cost of Polish Speedway. People often compare the price of British Speedway to Polish Speedway, but they often don't account for things like the Polish economy, which is different to the British one. At the time of recording, £1 was worth 5.42 Polish Lotti. Tickets range from 25 to 75 Lotti at Polish Speedway, dependent on where you attend, of course. So, for comparison's sake, we'll take the average of £9.22 per ticket, or 50 Lotti. The Polish median salary for full-time employment is £15,792.02. A Polish Speedway ticket costs 0.058% of your annual salary. The median salary in the UK is £31,461, so a Speedway ticket costs you 0.058% of an annual salary. We are paying the same as Poland's fans are based on what we earn. but. The Polish get to see the best riders in the world 
in the strongest Speedway League structure currently going. Again, this is oversimplifying the calculations considerably as it doesn't account for the economic flux, disposable income models and so on, but it gives you a ballpark idea of where British Speedway models stack up. In reality, any product is worth what someone will pay for it. Speedway in this country needs to understand its target demographic and price it accordingly. I'm only going to briefly go over this because I could make a whole report just on this topic because of how complex it is. I'm also conscious not to share confidential information so I won't be sharing exact figures with certain things. Workington Comets reinforce the very real and counterintuitive lesson that British Speedway hasn't learned. Success comes at a price. That price could mean closure. We touched on inflation and the economy when we talked about admission prices, but what we didn't really talk about was operational costs. Running a speedway team costs more now than ever. The money coming in is getting lower and the money going out is getting higher. Bikes in speedway have evolved into something completely different from what they were in the 1970s. The engines have changed into highly tuned rocket ships not only with higher outlaying costs but persistent tuning requirements. Gone are the days when a rider could be part-time treating Speedway almost as a hobby whilst having a day job to supplement their racing careers. Riders at the top level make good money but riders at the bottom barely scrape by. Just this year Nathan Greaves quit the sport with barely a penny to show for the broken bones, late nights in the workshop and driving across the country at the dead of night. Despite this the rising equipment costs mean the riders pay requirements go up promoters costs on riders goes up but the income levels from sponsorship and attendance hasn't increased to support it. Riders being part-time in the National League is fine but if we want British Speedway to remain a professional feature we need full-time professional riders. If the riders are going to be full-time they need assurances that their income won't disappear overnight because they've been dropped or injured. Yes, professional sport is generally a tough business, but the sacrifices we ask of these warriors and the risks that they take far outweigh that of any other sport that I know. Riders do it because they love it, not for the entertainment value, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be paid for their efforts. Great Britain has some amazing talent amongst its roster of riders. The progress Team GB's setup has made was vindicated by the stunning performance at Bellevue, lifting the World Pairs Trophy despite losing three times world champion Ty Woffington to injury. However, this doesn't mask the fact that the progress chain for British youth and the British League is unclear and a little bit unforgiving. We talked about the rider skill gap a bit when we covered doubling up. It's not a brand new issue for Speedway. In the 1970s, it wasn't uncommon to see a lowly junior roll up to tapes with Ivan Major. The skill gap has become a more prevalent issue though. There was an attempt to fast track riders into the top league when the BSPA changed the race card format and essentially had National League riders at reserve. However, the gulf in quality between the main body elite league teams and the reserves was huge. The skill gap runs the risk of having riders with good potential quitting too early because the professional riders are too strong for them and they can't see themselves getting to that level. There was a time when using teams number 8s or even their number 9s wasn't that unrealistic. The gradual phasing out of second halves led to the skill gap widening further between league standard reserves and juniors. Inevitably, British youth isn't up to standard when a rider in the league gets injured or isn't available, so we look abroad. In 2021, it would be almost unthinkable to use a National League rider in place of a main body professional, even in the championship, because the golfing class is just too severe. It is hard to pinpoint exactly where the problem started, the demise of the second division or the British League, the introduction of foreigners into the National League in the 1980s. Again, you could make an entire video just on this subject. In 2021, Great Britain is all but a launch pad to develop their careers before progressing to international standard competition in Sweden and then the pinnacle of competition in Poland. How do you get young talent interested in riding a speedway bike, for fun or professionally? It's a problem Discovery spotted as soon as they looked at Speedway GP. The natural dangerous nature of the sport makes it more difficult to entice new blood, 
especially people outside motorsports environments where broken bones isn't necessarily the norm. Football and rugby might have certain risks associated with them, but it's not on comparable terms with speedway or motocross in the eyes of the many. For every success story within the sport, a major injury will go viral. There is a community of amateur riders below National League set up who staged regular weekend fixtures. I've never really understood why the SGP haven't got involved and offered more support to amateur clubs. Just recently, Southern Track Riders, an establishment with more than 20 years of presence in the British Speedway, disappeared overnight, and all the families connected with the club and by association of sport went with it. We need a clear pathway to become a professional speedway rider for the outsider looking in. What training programs are there and where are they held? If a rider turns up to a Sunday practice with no professional presence, how are they really going to learn? I can personally recall Ulrich Ostergaard at Rye House taking the time to chat with me and give tips on riding style and adjusting my bike to help navigate the tight corners. On another occasion, Alan Mogridge at Scunthorpe, who was there with his son, gave me a simple piece of advice. Put your left leg on the peg when you don't need it to save energy on the straights. It was simple, but it was hugely effective. Team GB and the associated training programs are fantastic for riders established as career speedway riders. Now, we need to turn our attention to newcomers in the sport and nurse them through to Team GB programs already in place. We need to look after our riders and show them that we appreciate them, because without them, we don't have a sport. Promoters in Speedway often pick up the most criticism from supporters. If you think about it, promoting Speedway team is almost the most unforgiving position within British Speedway. When things go wrong, they get the blame, sometimes rightly, but often they are the object of frustration from within the fan base. Often decisions are made which, from the outside, make little to no sense with no explanation. The club owners set the rules, sometimes unevenly. We often hear stories of rules being changed to suit certain clubs or riders or decisions being made inconsistently. This year we had a great example with Redcar's visit to Birmingham. The match's start time was delayed due to issues with the track. Then a horror crash resulted in a delay due to a rider injury. The match was eventually abandoned because of the curfew and lack of medical cover. The result was not declared as only nine heats had been ridden. Birmingham got a second bite of the cherry and thrashed the Bears 55-35 on the restaging despite being eight points behind when the first fixture was abandoned. But you need to race 10 heats to declare a result, I hear you say. So what's the problem? Well, precedents had been set previously when Glasgow were awarded an away win at Redcar after the match was abandoned after Heat 9. Both matches were abandoned due to the curfew and medical cover. The track delay at Birmingham, wasting an hour pre-match, certainly wasn't Redcar's fault, yet the decision has gone against the Bears on both occasions. No explanation, no justification. That's the decision, and if you don't like it, tough. Speedway governing itself is probably one of the biggest problems of all. It's hard to prove balanced unbiased decisions and there's not enough adaption to the modern market through external advice. Let's be fair, many speedway tracks are running because of the promoter's love of the sport, not because it makes business sense. Rob Grant is a perfect example. He closed the doors at Newcastle because it was no longer sustainable, but he reopened them not because it made sense, but because of his emotional ties to the sport. He loves Newcastle with a passion. Despite all the personal sacrifices he has to make, he just wants to see Newcastle succeed. It's through sheer love. Speedway promoters care so much about Speedway. Perhaps this is kind of a problem. Their emotional attachment to the sport means they don't want to change it. They see the product as good enough. And I don't blame them because I feel the same way about Speedway. Speedway promotion is a thankless, money-burning task with no respite. They are trying everything they can, but they need support. They are tired and they want to enjoy their Speedway as much as we do. Many tracks are alive today because of their commitment to the cause. The old saying goes, how do you make a small fortune in Speedway? Well, you start with a large one. The truth is, the sport's future is in their hands. If changes are to happen, it's up to them to make those decisions. Time is running out for British Speedway. If we are to turn its fortunes around, they'll need to gamble on something different. Cricket managed it, ice hockey managed it. I'm sure as hell Speedway can manage it.
We need to restore confidence amongst the faithful fans of this sport. If we get the fans on side, then the hard part is done. Slowly, changes are occurring. Speedway is far from dead, I can assure you of that. As a pure product, it has enough to be successful. It's the only motorsport in the world where you can sit and see all of the action comfortably from one place. It's the business and practicality surrounding it that need to change. There are just too many variables that can go wrong and we don't have enough contingencies in place to manage it. Speedway can and it will survive and eventually it will thrive. But we've got a lot of work to do before we get there.